Everybody, Yarif Arahanev is at Stanford as a HANA visiting professor. The program was established by the family of Sehan, a longtime member of this department, in his honor. And the objective of the program is to enhance the research environment at Stanford by bringing eminent scientists to campus for extended stays, such as Yarif. Yarif is currently a professor of computer science and electrical engineering at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Back in the 1990s, in her PhD thesis, she established one of the most important and counterintuitive results in the whole field of quantum computation, what we call the fault tolerant threshold theory, which establishes that uh, if, it is, uh, if we manage to make quantum gates below some fixed threshold quality value, uh, then from there, using software essentially, we can scale up to perform quantum computations at arbitrary accuracy uh, and arbitrary size. If it were not for that result, there would not be a lot of interest in quantum computation these days. Since then, she has re remained one of the deepest and most incisive thinkers in the whole field, uh, and has contributed seminal results to the power of adiabatic quantum computation, quantum algorithms for knot invariance, the computational structure of quantum phases, uh, and many other uh, very exciting and interesting results. So we're delighted to have her here today uh, so that she could offer us her perspective on the relationship between computational complexity and quantum physics. I should say, she flew overnight from Israel, uh, landed about five hours ago, and is speaking to you now, uh, is hoping not to fall asleep. Uh, but uh, we figured this would be the best way to maximize uh, the, the effectiveness of her visit. So you get to meet her right now, uh, and you can make, uh, make contact with her over the course of the next week, and she'll be back for a longer visit in the future. Makes it worth to speak at 3 a.m. in the morning, my time. Um, so thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, and uh, okay, that's what I'm going to talk about. I want to talk about the, the relationship between um, quantum physics and the computational perspective, or uh, theoretical computer science. And um, and essentially, one can ask, well. Um, Quantum physics has been here for 100 years. Why is it that uh, we are seeing so many things happening these days in quantum physics where uh, uh, all these ideas have been here for so long? And I want to say it's not just because, of course, there's a lot of interest in quantum computation, and this contributes a lot to, uh, to the interest in, in uh, various aspects uh, that connect quantum, quantum computers and, uh, sorry, computers and, and quantum physics. But there's a deeper reason why we're seeing um, so many uh, excitement, uh, so much excitement about um, ideas coming from quantum computation in quantum physics. And uh, the deeper reason, in my mind, is essentially the depth of, uh, of theoretical computer science. So I think this, what, what we can see is the, the second quantum revolution uh, can be attributed to, to the to sort of to, to, to the penetration of ideas from theoretical computer science, such as complexity, universality, hardness of, uh, of computation, where is that? I'm mean, pointing at myself. Um, um, reductions, approximation, robustness, error correction, all these things um, have also their means uh, and interpretations of physics, but uh, in computer science, they have a different perspective. And somehow, over the past, um, few decades, they start to penetrate into physics. And I think you're all familiar with several very uh, uh, well-known examples, like the connection between error correction and ADS-CFT, um, and uh, topological order, uh, and uh, quantum microactive codes, such as the Tori code of Kitayev, and, um, and uh, complexity and quantum gravity connection due to Susskind and friends. Um, but I think there's a deeper there is a deeper sort of underlying um, structure to all this, and this is the fact that uh, the theory of computation, and note this is not the same as the theory of information. The theory of computation is the theory of uh, how we process informa information and, uh, and uh, make it into uh, a form which is useful for you. And that's different than information theory. So the computational theory has, uh, has depth and has the uh, um, fundamental ideas that sort of penetrate, start penetrating into physics 
via the interest in quantum computation, but it has many, many more directions where it can, it can influence. And what I'd like to do today is to sort of um, give you a, a tour through this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, interaction between theoretical computer science and physics um, through two examples. So the two examples I'll take, um, it's not specific examples, sort of themes. Um, one of them is the notion of complexity of ground states. Um, so the question of, uh, of how can we understand ground states of local Hamiltonians from the computational complexity perspective. And, uh, and I'll sort of lead us to a question that has to do with uh, uh, the attempt to uh, sort of uh, draw a phase diagram uh, has to do with computational complexity of ground states of local Hamiltonians. Then the second example is a computational perspective on experiments and measurements. Um, so, um, so viewing experiments and measurements from a computational perspective actually sheds light and suggests new ideas of what we can do with, uh, in, with experiments. Um, so, so I'll talk about that, and if, if I have time, I will maybe mention just uh, how, how studies that actually have to do with both directions uh, simultaneously led to, to an amazing triumph, which I think everybody's heard of, at least, uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, a, a triumph of the quantum community uh, that using ideas from quantum computation led to a resolution of, uh, of a very important conjecture in mathematics. That's the quantum bending conjecture. Okay, so, so, let's, so in order to start, uh, let me start with, uh, um, with the basics of um, of what is a computation? Okay, so what's a computation? Um, essentially, I want to view a computation as a process which takes as input something, some string of bits, um, encoding some, some whatever, so anything can be encoded with a string of bits um, if, you, if you give up some uh, precision, and, uh, and perform some process of, uh, some physical process and outputs again a string of bits. And um, okay, and, and one can ask how can we model such a process? And Turing was the first to, to provide a mathematical model for that. That's a Turing machine. And I won't uh, explain what it is, just that with a very simple structure, uh, um, simply defined structure, infinite tape and finite alphabet and some finite state machine and local rules, there's a head here that runs back and forth and reads and writes output uh, based on what it sees locally, um, you can get to any computation that you can, that, that is possible to compute. Um, that's universal, universal um, computation. And it turns out that this universal uh, Turing machine actually captures whatever computation that can be done. So you can think of DNA, uh, DNA computing, or you can think of uh, um, the Game of Life by uh, John Conway, um, with with its uh, very simple rules that update whether a, a cell here is alive or dead, and uh, yet with these very simple rules, you get to the complexity that made it deserve the name Game of Life. Um, and this is uh, this is sort of common to all these models that they all have very simple rules that somehow by accumulation um, you get very high complexity. And the point is that these, all these models, and many others, seem to be equivalent. They all have uh, the structure of local rules updating each other, and they all can simulate each other by uh, efficiently. Uh, meaning, with only polynomial overhead, if you have some process that takes n time steps or t time steps, uh, the same process can be simulated by another uh, model here with only polynomial and n time steps. Um, and, this, and this phenomena was given uh, a name um, called the extended church Turing thesis. And what's the extended church Turing thesis? It says, essentially, it captures uh, exactly this phenomenon, that, uh, um, that all these models are polynomially equivalent. Um, so, stating it more exactly, all physically reasonable computational models can be simulated with polynomial overhead by a Turing machine. Okay, and here's a catch. 
the physically reasonable, I mean, this has to somehow obey reasonable laws, like uh, uh, not infinite precision, uh, um, some finite amount of energy per time step, etc. So as long as uh, things are reasonable, um, any model that you can think of can be simulated by a Turing machine in polynomial time. That's what Christina said, says. And of course, if you're familiar with quantum computation, you would know that this, it, this quantum computation does not obey these things. Okay? So, quantum computation is the only model that credibly challenges these things. And uh, we do not know how to, how to simulate quantum computers by, uh, by classical Turing machine. By the way, ask me questions because otherwise I'm really going, it's 3 a.m. in the morning and it's getting later. So, and maybe I'll wake up at 4 a.m. So, please ask questions. Um, okay, so, or make uh, remarks or whatever. Okay, so, so what's, um, um, so in order to really talk about competition, let's just start with, with what am I talking about, just so that we're on the same ground. We have a qubit, uh, that's our elementary device, uh, elementary unit of information. And, uh, and what's a qubit? Well, we don't care that's one of the powers of quantum computation, but uh, of abstracting the physical implementation out and taking just the mathematics, very simple model of mastery. Um, so we don't care if it's a spin of an electron that uh, realizes a qubit or Schrodinger's cat, which is uh, who's dead and alive at the same time, as long as, um, as, long as it's a two-state uh, quantum system, which can be in a superposition of its basic states. And um, <coughs> it's actually good that I have to write around it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so when you say, when we say a qubit, we mean a Hilbert space of two dimensions, where the state of one qubit is this unit vector, a0 plus b1, 0 and 1 indicate these two basic states, which we don't care what, how we implement at this point. Well, of course, here we try to implement them, but for analyzing and modeling them, this is fine for us. And then, for a single qubit, we can do various things. By quantum mechanics, we can apply uh, unitaries, let it evolve by Schrodinger's equation. Um, and in quantum computing language, we call it gates. Um, and the reason why we call it gates is, um, is because eventually we'll talk about many qubits and we'll, we'd like to somehow apply elementary unitaries um, that correspond to, to classical gates, elementary gates, that s sort of accumulate to give us the complexity. So, um, so unitaries on small number of qubits will be called gates. So this is a, a very famous quantum gate, <coughs> this is the matrix that describes it, but we like sometimes to talk about how to describe it by how it acts on, uh, on the basis states. So zero goes to zero plus one, plus state, and one goes to zero minus one, that's the minus state. So we can apply such gates, and of course we can also measure, and again we can abstract out uh, many of the complexities of the complications, and we just talk about uh, the usual textbook measurement of uh, uh, collapsing to zero to one with those probabilities. Um, okay, so, so that's a single cube, and the magic in quantum computation happens when you put together n subsystems where n becomes large. Um, so as you all know, we add a qubit, the, the Hilbert space, uh, the dimension of the Hilbert space is multiplied by 2. Um, and, or by d, if, if we're talking about the qubit. Um, but in any case, any, any, any particle that we add multiplies the dimension by some factor. And so eventually, what we have is a state which is um, which is a superposition over the exponential in many possible configurations of the system. And, and already, well, with 53 qubits, uh, Google can, uh, can simulate this, but with uh, uh, 100 qubits, it can no longer simulate it. Okay, so, uh, so with, one, with already 100 qubits here, uh, we have a state which cannot be described in our world, essentially. Maybe you need a few more. Um, Okay, so, so now, what are the ingredients that we have to insert into this, uh, not that we have to insert, but somehow that are already in it, that, that are being used in quantum algorithms? Um, well, well, I want to, uh, first of all, we don't know. I mean, admit that. Uh, we know very little about quantum algorithms. 
But uh, what we do know is that there are two main ingredients that we like to talk about, entanglement and interference. So entanglement is this mysterious uh, thing that somehow uh, um, makes the correlation between different particles uh, stronger than classical. And we have various uh, types of entanglement, like uh, an EPR pair, uh, which we understand very well, at least uh, theoretically, maybe not conceptually. Uh, and then we have uh, more and more complicated types of entanglement, like the entanglement of, uh, of the Tauri code, the topological order, where, um, or with or in topological order, where you have um, correlations that somehow depend on the topology of the system, so, so they are somehow spread globally on the system. And this already seems quite complicated, but in fact, the complication of entanglement grows to the extent that we don't know how to describe entanglement. Um, so if you look at the Hilbert space of, uh, of uh, all of n quantum states, of n qubits, well, the quantum states of such, uh, of, of such a system, um, there are doubly exponentially many of those. So of course you will not be able to describe them. But even if you just look at the states that are of interest to us, these are the states that uh, we have a chance to reach in our lifetime. These are the states that, by a quantum computer, can be reachable in polynomial time. And I'll explain why I'm, why I'm equating these two things in a moment, in, maybe in a few minutes. Even if you look just at those reachable states, these reachable states um, already are extremely entangled, extremely complicated uh, in, in their entanglement, and we have no idea how to describe this, uh, the, the different types of entanglement. Okay, but anyway, this is one ingredient, and, and the other ingredient is, of course, interference. Um, and, um, well, uh, interference we all know, uh, but let me just, anyway, say, just for, uh, go over it for one minute, because it plays such an important role in, in quantum algorithms. Um, so, here is the Hadamard gate, and, uh, and we think of it as a coin flip, because, um, because when you apply it on either 0 or 1 and you measure, you get a random bit. Okay. But then if you apply the Hadamard again um, on, say, this state, you get 0 plus 1 from the 0 and 0 minus 1 from the 1. And, uh, and we get the familiar, the old familiar destructive interference in the constellation of the, of the 1 and the minus 1. Um, and this phenomena, this uh, naive, uh, this maybe simple phenomena, um, is very important because it allows, well, with, with a single qubit, it's not very interesting. But when you talk about interference between 2 to the n <coughs> possible path, uh, as you do in a quantum computer, then you get uh, very complicated patterns. And if you design them in a clever way, you can, you can reach um, to, you can reach patterns which are which can solve for you very complicated problems. Okay, so these with these two ingredients um, at our hands, we we sort of we want to try and solve various problems, and we do that using the model of quantum circuits. Um, so let me describe it to you again, so that we are on the same ground. Mm. So what's a quantum circuit? I basically described it already, but let me. Um, it sort of in one slide so that you have it in mind. Um, so the quantum circuit is this. You have n qubits, and uh, they're initiated with, uh, with some, uh, each qubit is initiated in a state 0 or 1, so they're initiated in some basis states out of the two to the possibilities. And then they evolve by some uh, Schrodinger's equation, by some Hamiltonian. Uh, according to to some to, to some u, which which is given by this uh, evolution, and then we measure say all the bits at the end. But the evolution that we allow is not general. Um, we only allow the evolutions that uh, result from applying uh, local gates. Okay, I'll measure local gates. And the reason is that uh, first of all, this is what we can do in the lab, and uh, or at least this is a. Uh, most of what we can do in the lab. And uh, theoretically, it's, it's, uh, it's nice to have this model because, uh, because then we can start talking about what happens when the size of the input grows and how the number of gates scale with the size of the input. And then we can talk about the complexity of the problem, which is, uh, which is basically asking whether this number of gates here grows like polynomial, like exponential, or like 
something, I don't know, in here, whatever. Um, and I should mention that the choice of which gates we allow is not very important. Um, it's, so you can use Hadamard and all classical gates, including three three bit classical gates, and that would suffice to approximate any evolution that you want. Um, but on the other hand, you can also use many other choices. And it turns out there's a very clever theorem called the Solovic Tag theorem that says that uh, the complexity in one basis is the same as the complexity of, of the other, using the other set of gates, um, it's up to polynomial or actually logarithmic um, over it. So it's the same, and so the notion of complexity of quantum gates doesn't depend on the set of gates, and we can talk about uh, when a problem can be solved in polynomial time by a quantum computer and when it cannot. <coughs> okay, so that's quantum algorithms, and with that, um, we have a bunch of quantum algorithms that we know how to do. Um, they're just, they're a bit more than Schoen's algorithm, but with the amount of effort that uh, people have invested in quantum computation, you would expect more. Um, unfortunately, we don't, we don't have many quantum algorithms, and, uh, um, and those that we do have don't seem to be too useful. For, for very interesting stuff, except for simulating quantum systems, which would be interesting for, for most physicists at least, um, and linear equations and stuff like that, which is uh, some result of, of uh, the last decade or so, which under certain situations seem very useful, but it's not clear exactly what context. Um, so it's not that they solve linear equations per se exponentially faster, but with certain conditions and, okay, so in any case, all these algorithms give you exponential algorithmic speed up and, uh, and that, that is an evidence that the model is exponentially stronger. Okay, so, so just to summarize this uh, introductory part, um, using computational complexity language, here's our computational complexity map. So I'm going to bombard you in this slide with a few collections of letters because as coming from a computer science department, I cannot avoid doing that. Um, so BQP. BQP is the class of problems solvable in polynomial time by quantum computers. So these are the problems that can be solved. If we have one here, these will be trackable. And BPP is the same, but um, if we have only classical computers, augmented with random bits. Actually we believe that it doesn't matter, so BPP equals P which is the same deterministic classical computation, but we don't yet know that. Okay, so, so factoring and the rest of the problems that I mentioned belong here. And we believe very strongly that BPP is different than BPP because of those examples. Uh, and because we, we don't know how to simulate BPP in BPP. We don't know how to simulate quantum circuits in, by, by classical algorithms. And, um, and so this is the reason why uh, we think that quantum computation will violate the extended church during this. Because, uh, um, because we don't know how to simulate that in polynomial time. And, so we, we, and this is because we believe that BQP is strictly larger than BQP. But there's also another reason, which is that we believe that BQP is, can be implemented in reality. And this is because, well, Patrick mentioned it in this beautiful introduction, um, that uh, um, we know we know that if there if there is errors which are local under some conditions, then uh, we can sort of compute in the presence of noise uh, without damaging the computational power of the computer. So, to the best of our understanding now, this is a reasonable model of computation and does not assume too much about precision. Yes. Um, well, a very rough intuition is uh, essentially that factoring turns out to be classically equivalent to finding some period of, of uh, a number modulo a huge number. And a period can be found by applying the Fourier transform. And it turns out that uh, quantum computers can do Fourier transforms exponentially faster than classical computers. So it's because there is some structure there. Um, and we don't know how to apply quantum algorithms without having the very specific 
structure. And that's why the number of quantum algorithms that we have is so limited. Okay, great. So, um, so okay. So now, um, okay. So now, uh, then we're done with the introduction. Any questions about what I said so far? Okay, so um, I want to, to step from that part to where, to what I promised, to the connection to physics. And I think the most important notion, there are many notions that connect somehow cognition complexity with, with, with quantum physics, but I think the most important notion that came from the study of quantum computers into quantum physics is a notion which maybe is not explicitly said but it's sort of underlying many of the new understandings. And that's the notion of reduction. <coughs> what is a reduction? It's sort of an equivalence between different physical systems, completely, that may be completely different, but the equivalence it comes from uh, a point of view which is very different than the usual physical point of view. Okay, so what do I mean? Here is an example, essentially, of this notion. So I could have, I, I've, given you, um, I've given you a description of quantum model using quantum circuits, but I could have given you a description using also topological quantum field theory and gradient. And I would have given you the same a model which I claimed to be equivalent. It would have also computed DQB. And in fact, I could have also given you a, um, a quantum model using what's called measurement-based quantification, which is based on preparing a highly entangled state and then just measuring it, no heat. Um, or an adiabatic quantum computer, which starts with some ground state of a simple Hamiltonian and then evolves a diabatic gap <coughs> to some final Hamiltonian and measuring that final ground state. Um, and that's also equivalent. And then there are also other models that are equivalent. Um, you can define a Riemannian geometry model of quantum computer, uh, which evolves along the geodesic in some uh, Riemannian manifold. Uh, and it turns out that if you define the metric correctly, it's also equivalent to, uh, uh, to quantum computer. And, um, and quantum rocks is another model which is equivalent. And there are more. And that, I think, is really impressive and really surprising that so many different models, and uh, some of them very different physical models, um, behave the same. They have the same, somehow they behave the same in their underlying structure. And uh, this is captured, let's, let's look at it from, from the angle of, of computer science. Um, what do I mean by the fact that they, are, that they could have given you the model using these, uh, the quantum model using these models? Well, the point is that there's efficient reductions, polynomial time reductions, that take any quantum circuit and map it, maps it to one of these models, and vice versa. So what I mean by that is that if I had, for example, an adiabatic computer and I wanted to run a quantum circuit, I could have somehow uh, translated this quantum circuit into a, a final and an initial Hamiltonian and, and let this adiabatic evolution evolve and that would have given me the answer. And this translation is an easy translation. It just requires some classical computer to, to do a work in, in polynomial time. And likewise for all other models. So, so this, these all models, and I forgot to put all the error, all of them are equivalent. And that means that they're all also equivalent between themselves. And um, this is really uh, impressive that one can actually create so many um, such deep connections or such uh, strong connections between such different physical systems. Yeah? Question. So you have, many of those are actual quantum versions, but the Riemannian geometry is classical. Are you in one higher dimension, or why is it equivalent to this quantum system? Well, you could also argue this about uh, the Udibatic model, which is also classical in some sense because it's defined with local Hamiltonians. Uh, the point is that to perform the computation, to actually simulate this, you need, it's very hard. So the fact that, so depending on what you ask, what is classical and what is quantum, 
even the description of the quantum circuit is, in a sense, classical. Um, so the question is, how do you actually define the computational model? And the computational model here is defined by give me uh, an initial point and a velocity and a time, and then and that's the input, and then you have to find what, uh, what's the output at the end. So um, I think I'll have an easier time to, to, to describe it with an idiomatic model. Um, in the idiomatic model, you're, you can also make everything local. You have n qubits and local Hamiltonians acting on them. So these are just classically described by a very simple description. But the solution to the problem of evolving a diabetic from this Hamiltonian to this Hamiltonian on the convex, on the convex side connecting them, if you were able to simulate that and give the answer, then you were also able to, to simulate a quantum circuit. That's the point. So it's giving you, it's giving you not the, the implementation, it's giving you the question. Yeah. Can you uh, s still make strong statements about error correction when you make the translation? Uh, no, that's a very good question. For example, in the abatic computation, uh, we lose, uh, we don't know how to do photon quantum computation in the abatic computation because um, somehow the model of noise is not clear how it is mapped. Um, so, yes, you could map the noise here to here and then everything would work, but if you now look at physical systems that actually work at the Avatar Committee with local Hamiltonians, then the noise model has changed, and that's not clear. Okay, so, okay, so now that we sort of know what we aspire to, that sort of, everything is, everything, every one of these models is universal, we can also now talk about, oops, what happened here? Okay, we can also, first of all, all of these models are captured in this class of VQP. And we can also, um, it makes sense to now talk about um, realize that, that, uh, that the <coughs> expenditure of Turing thesis, which is validated, seems to be, by a quantum computer, can now be replaced by something that talks about universality of quantum systems, which so far we have no candidate against, no candidate that might validate it. The quantum church during thesis that all says that all physically reasonable computational models can be similarly to polynomial overhead by the quantum computer. So the quantum computer sort of captures what's doable in the world. In, in, and universally so if you look through the lens of the computation. Okay, so the equivalence relation is by uh, simulating or computing in polynomial time this system and then knowing that this, there's a map, a polynomial map from this system to, to that system. Okay, so this is, um, this is a very deep notion. Uh, and I know I'm going to very, sort of, in a, in a too much in a bird's, in a, in a bird's eye view, but yeah. Um, um, it's hard to, to grasp, but, uh, but if once you're, and I think it, it, it also explains why it took so long until I started to enter physics. Um, but I think it's very deep. And then once you know, um, once you know that, uh, that you can classify, that, once you know what you aspire for, meaning what, once you know what's sort of fully quantum, then you can start talking about uh, what's not fully quantum, and uh, talk about what you need quantum models, and maybe that's what people are sort of trying to do when they talk about quantum supremacy, which is sort of do something which is in BQP and not in BPP, that is quantum advantage over classical, but maybe not exactly at the very uh, end. Yes? Sorry, I have a question about the previous stuff. Yeah. Um, so it seems like the quantum, naively, it seems like the quantum church tooling is the same that everything we can imagine can be done by quantum computers. Right. In quantum so, mechanics. Does that mean that if I, it just means if I assume quantum mechanics indeed describes everything in the world, then this is automatically true? No. Because we automatically are, are running quantum computers. Well, if quantum mechanics is false, is complete, then yes. Then, 
Um, so there are lots of details that, that are missing here, like uh, quantum field theory. Can we actually simulate that by so John Preskill and, uh, and collaborators have been working on this? There, there are many details in this picture that are sort of glossing over. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge, the answer is yes. Okay, so so now let's go back, let's go to, to our two examples that I promised you. And let's start with the uh, example of, <coughs> of the complexity of ground states. How am I doing on time? I don't know. Uh, you have about 20 minutes. Okay. So, um, <coughs> so what are the total complexity? Um, okay, so I promised you um, to talk about uh, the complexity of ground states and to sort of, uh, well, maybe you didn't really promise it, but okay. Um, uh, I meant to talk about uh, complexity of ground states and understanding whether we can classify how hard are uh, certain ground states with respect to others. But there's already, right from the start, there's a problem because, um, because when we talk about comparing quantum and classical, well, we had hard problems. We had uh, problems which were hard for, for classical, and then they, were, they became easy quantumly. Um, but, um, but static problems uh, are, are sort of, so, all, so when we talk about the ground states, these problems are hard for everybody. Uh, there's nothing, no dynamics that will find them. Uh, so we need to somehow sort of raise our scale and find a way to talk about problems which are really, really hard in order to, to assign some computational complexity language to questions about ground states. So let me just, that was part of the problem very mysterious, but let, me, let me just give an example. Uh, here's the, an Ising uh, spin class, for example, um, and it's defined by these uh, interactions right here. And you want to know, and you're also given an energy, you want to know if there exists an assignment to the spins with energy less than or equal to, to some given energy. So this problem is hard. In order to answer it, you probably need to go through all the possibilities and, and uh, compute the energy and then find if one of them is smaller than the given energy. But if you're given a certain configuration, then you can easily check it. Right? If you're given a certain conversion, you can easily compute the energy, easily meaning in polynomial time and linear time, in polynomial time and the number of nodes here, you can easily check the energy and, and decide if the answer is yes or no. So um, in computer science, a very important notion that turned out to be very, very useful in understanding such <coughs> version of optimization problems is the notion of NP. Um, What's NP? It's exactly this class of problems, which when you're given a suggested solution, it's easy for a polynomial time verifier to verify that the solution indeed satisfies the requirements. Okay, so, so <coughs> um, a crucial, uh, an important uh, theorem in, uh, in uh, classical NP theory, in classical theory of uh, computation, is that this problem, as well as many other problems, is what's called NP complete. I think I'm confused now. The spin class, it's easy to calculate the energy. Right. It's not easy to tell whether that's the ground state energy. It's easy to calculate the energy of a given configuration. Yes. Yeah. But it's not easy to know whether you've got the ground state. Right, right, right. So I have, uh, uh, right. This is not really answering the question, do you have the ground state? This is answering the question, which I modified, Given a threshold energy, do you have an energy less than that? Okay, so, so there's the Kuklevin theorem, which says that these problems sum total are universal for all NP part for all NP problems. So this kind of problem, any problem of this type can be mapped to it in polynomial time. So in a certain sense, this is exactly the same idea of reduction, but now in the world of NP instead of in the world of Algorithms. Okay, so in order to understand ground state complexity, we need to do the same quantumly, and I'm not going to go into the details of that. I just want to give you a glimpse of what's going on there, um, because because it's a very deep theory, and, uh, and we really don't have time to go there. But the point is that Kintaro, we tried to do this um, in 98 already. Um, 
he, he looked at, at the local Hamiltonian problem, at, at local Hamiltonians, at the, the goal of sort of understanding the ground energy of such Hamiltonians, and he massaged this problem into a computational uh, looking problem, which is you're given a local Hamiltonian, a sum of such local terms, and, and some, uh, some threshold energy, and you want to approximate whether, you want to basically know whether the lowest energy is above uh, or below a certain number. Um, well, actually, what you're given is some approximation window. A is the top part of this window, and B is the bottom part, and you want to know if the energy is above A or below B. So basically, you want to approximate the ground energy of a local Hamiltonian to within some value in this polynomial. And it turns out, first of all, what he had noticed is that this is, though it looks like a, um, a computer science version of a very physical problem, it's just a generalization of, of these NP part problems, of these uh, uh, local constraints problems. And, and, uh, and it turns out the whole theory of, uh, <coughs> of NP completeness essentially carries over to, to quantum NP. So one can define the notion of quantum NP, and, uh, and the only difference, the only big, big difference, is that now the ground states can be highly entangled. But other than that, many of the properties of the theory of NP go uh, sort of carry over to the theory of quantum NP. And so, uh, okay, so <coughs> without defining quantum NP, just telling you that you just take the definition of NP and make it quantum by adding Q in front of everything. Um, the, quantum, the verifier is quantum, the, the witness, the solution is quantum. Um, so Kitab showed that the local Hamiltonian problem that I said, that I told you about before, is universal, is complete for quantum entity. And that's sort of the analog of this notion of universality in the dynamics setting, but now it's in the static set setting, in the ground state setting. Okay, so, so now what can we deduce from that? Well, we can make a Hamiltonian roadmap. We can start sort of drawing what we understand about various types of Hamiltonians. Um, so we can ask whether 2D Hamiltonians are hard like that. And it turns out that yes, even though the first constructions are highly non-local geometrically, but if you put them on a 2D grid, it's also QMA hard, quantum NP hard. QMA is sort of the synonym for quantum NP. Um, and even in 1D, that's true, even in 1D, if you tailor the Hamiltonians, you can make the problem quantum NP part. And this is counterintuitive because of DMRG, but still it's true. Even though heuristically we can solve 1D problems most of the time. And with, what is really mind-boggling is that you can even get hardness if your problem is transition -variant. So. If your, uh, your Hamiltonian is such that it's a Monty and all the local terms are the same, and all you know is just the, the length, that the input is just the length of the, of the line here, the problem is so hard to decide. So it's really depending a lot on the length. Um, okay, and, and so you can encode, so often I hear, uh, I hear people say that these quantum NP Problems are sort of highly contrived. Highly, they're very far from physics. You need to really tailor the system so that you get hardness. But in general, it's not hard. But this is really getting close to physics. This is transition variant 1D. Okay, the dimensionality is really large of each particle. But still, probably will be reduced soon or sometime. Um, this is really a physical uh, system here that, that, uh, that exhibits hardness. Um, okay, so, so let me skip the, the other side of the, of, the, of the equation for lack of time and just say, um, because I want to get to the next, the next stage, but I do want to say something about this part. So the transition variant thing enables us to actually ask um, or to actually assign hardness to a given term, a given two-body term in the Hamiltonian. So this, this notion that the, the, given a term in the Hamiltonian, you can say whether there is condition complexity hardness assigned to it, enables us to actually talk about the parameter space of the Hamiltonian and say, well, this 
this is the parameter space. A point here is a single term in the Hamiltonian. Is this point computation hard or not? Or universal or not? And then you can talk about a phase diagram um, of, of, these, uh, of, of this parameter space. So, whether, whether, so a computational phase diagram, which would be defined de depending on which, uh, which definition of universality you take. You can take uh, this quantum entry hardness by Gordon Smiley-Rani, or you can also take a um, uh, slightly different question of whether, whether the, this term, the two-body term in the Hamiltonian, creates dynamics which is universal, which can also be done with the translation invariant system. And then for every point, you have here whether it's universal or hard or not. And then you can ask, how does this look? And the truth is, we know absolutely nothing, almost nothing, about how does it look. We know a few points that are hard, and that's it. We don't know the most basic questions like, uh, our typical problem is hard or easy? Um, is hardness stable or is it sensitive to the small perturbations? Um, like very simple questions that we don't know. And unfortunately, it looks like we're not going to know in the near future because um, this question seems to be tightly related to the question of gapness of Hamiltonians. At least in one D, when the Hamiltonian is gapped. Uh, it becomes easy, even though when it's not gap, we know it's quite an empty part. Um, and in gap systems, you can also talk about this phase diagram right, with, with respect to the question of gapness. And then there's a remarkable result, recent result, uh, not recent, not so recent, but uh, a remarkable uh, evolution uh, of uh, the past uh, five years that, uh, that talks about the uh, the fact that the, the spectral gap, or deciding whether a system is gapped or not, is undecided. So we cannot expect to actually understand the space that What is undecided? Undecidable means that there is no algorithm that stops at a, given, at a finite time and tells you is, is the answer yes or no. Is this for infinite systems or finite systems? It's for infinite systems. Infinite. Yeah. If it's, Something which can go to zero then? So gap means that it's bounded away from zero. Bounded away from zero independent of n? Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is a remarkable result. Uh, both papers, this goes for 2D and this goes for 1D, and I think all of both of them, each of them is more than 100 than something pages. Um, okay, so this is, I think they're really beautiful questions here. But I want to tell you, in my last few minutes, uh, something about the other direction. Um, I need an update. Ten minutes. Huh? You're asking about time? Yeah. Ten, okay. Looks like time is stretching. It's stretching. Um, okay, so experiments and measurements from a computational perspective. Okay, apologies for those of you who have seen this. Um, but here's my uh, cartoon of a physical experiment. Um, this is an experimentalist, and this is a theoretician, and uh, this is a theory. And, um, and the experimentalist wants to test a theory, it initializes the system in some initial condition, <coughs> and runs an experiment, and the theoretician also initialized the computation in some initial conditions, and predicts what the theory predicts computes what the theory predicts, and then they meet and compare. Um, so let's call it the predict and compare product. Okay, so that's sort of a very simplistic way of describing how an experiment looks like. Um, but if you, if you look into it, you would see that, based on what we said before, if you put here many-body quantum physics, one part of the equation doesn't, doesn't work. This part, the prediction part, can no longer be done in efficiently. Using our, in our lifetime, we cannot predict uh, universal quantum evolutions or highly complicated quantum evolutions. So how can we compare to something which we cannot predict? So, um, so this is a mind-boggling observation um, that basically turns on its head the fact that uh, quantum uh, computation is more powerful than classical. 
And, uh, and it says that you cannot test the quantum universal regime um, in the usual predictive pair product. This brings us to various disturbing questions, like can we test quantum mechanics? Um, can experimentalists test what they do uh, in, in many body quantum physics to the extent that, they, that we want to test highly complex uh, dynamics or highly complex uh, phenomena that we cannot simulate classically? Uh, cryptography, can we trust um, uh, <coughs> companies that we want to delegate uh, our computers, our, our computations to them, and they give us the answer based on their quantum computer? How do we trust it? So it's sort of a question of how does a little um, small creature uh, somehow interact with a huge quantum creature without understanding what it does and still being able to, to understand or to, to uh, cope with it. Um, okay, so it turns out that something can be done, and that again comes from theoretical computer science. Uh, and again, apologies for those who have heard me being a magician before. So I'm a magician, um, and there's no window in this whole large auditorium. But imagine that there's a window, and there's a tree outside, and I know how to, and I tell you that I know how to count the number of leaves on a tree and I ask you to point me to some tree, and I'll count for you the number of leaves, and I, I look at the number of leaves, I look at the tree, and I tell you the number of leaves are, is uh, 900,070. Uh, and, uh, okay, you want to verify me. Uh, you want to verify that I really can count the number of leaves on this tree in the blink of an eye, and I didn't count it before. So, um, you could go and count your, the leaves yourself, which would take you too long. But here's a way for you to do this with randomness and interaction, which would be much more efficient. You make sure that I don't peek. I know you ask a friend to make sure that I'm not peeking. And then you go and tear off a random small number of leaves. And then you ask me, what's the number of leaves on the tree now? And if it's consistent, you get convinced to some extent. But if I pass the test again and again and again, you get convinced with probability which decays as fast, exponentially fast to zero um, that, that I achieved. Uh, okay, so this is how you use randomness and interaction to get convinced of something that you don't know, and even after being convinced, you don't know how to do it with a new trick. Um, okay, and it turns out that this, uh, this sort of uh, tricky sounding uh, idea is, is very profound again. Uh, and in, in quantum, in a classical theoretical computer science, it has been used in the, in the, in the study, in the attempt to understand what's a proof. And so a verifier and an all powerful prover come into play in this model of interactive proofs of Goldwasser, Mikani, and Rachel, where this prover tries to convince the verifier, a weak verifier computationally, of some very complicated claim. And it turns out that using randomness and interaction, they can do that. They, she can get convinced, in a way that he cannot cheat her, of highly complicated claims that she would not have been a, have, she would not be able to compute on, on her own or to to understand on her own. So, um, so this is a result from theoretical computer science long ago, which has led to many many different uh, applications. But uh, but now, let's take inspiration from this and. Since we want to understand claims or, or uh, um, behaviors of very complicated systems which we cannot handle, maybe we can also use interaction and sort of create interaction between the verifier and experimentalist and the quantum computer, which is very strong, and using randomness and interaction, maybe we can understand what's going on even without really being able to predict what will, what will be the answer or what will be the outcome of the, of the experiment. So this is a notion of interactive experiments. And we've been sort of seeing examples of this um, in, in various ways in quantum cryptography. And it turns out that, yes, if we introduce interaction into uh, our um, sort of the way we, we do experiments with, uh, that, with uh, imaginary quantum computers, like theoretically, we could actually verify that the evolution is correct. Um, so there is one line of works where this can be done with this, if, if you allow the interaction to include a single qubit or 
uh, a small number of qubits between the computer and the verifier. Um, so that corresponds to the, 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 uh, the weak verifier just being controlling a single qubit or three qubits out of the big computer, but still being convinced that the whole evolution is correct, including the entanglement, including everything. Um, I won't go into how this works. It uses quantum error correcting codes, but I won't tell you about it. And then Mahadev, um, in a breakthrough result, uh, showed how to do this with only classical interaction if you assume some cryptographic assumptions. So when the verifier is not, does not need this extra qubit, but, uh, but there are some assumptions that go into this. And it's a big, big open question uh, whether verification can be done with only classical, uh, with just classical ver uh, verifier. Uh, so no, no quantum interaction. Um, <clears throat> so I should mention uh, something on the side, um, which is that if you do allow, if you allow the classical verification, but instead of a single quantum computer that you interact with, you allow two quantum computers that are not allowed to communicate between them, then verification is possible. And this is sort of like uh, uh, interrogating two thieves. If you prevent communication between them, it's easier to make sure they're consistent between themselves. And uh, so in this model, these two thieves, quantum computers, are entangled, and this verifier is interrogating them classically, and it turns out that in this model too, one can get convinced that a computation or a quantum evolution is done correctly. And um, <coughs> if you've heard of this uh, remarkable result of uh, MMP star uh, contain of the cons of Benning conjecture being refuted. How many have heard of this? Okay. Uh, so this is actually a byproduct of investigating results like uh, like this thing, uh, because uh, these two provers um, in my picture were just two quantum computers. But you can think theoretically about these two provers as, as all powerful devices, um, and they're allowed to be entangled. And by analyzing what's the power of this model, um, a bunch of, uh, of, uh, of guys just uh, last month um, announced that uh, this model too, of which problems can be uh, proved in, uh, with multi-prover interactive proofs, with these several provers who are entangled, this is the star, the entanglement, it turns out that this contains undecidable language. Um, and this somehow led to the refutation of Kohn's abetting conjecture and of Tirosin conjecture, which I'm happy to describe to you offline. Um, do I have a time for the next uh, Oh, no. Hmm? No, okay. So I wanted to tell you very briefly about uh, work in progress with Xiaoyong Xi and with Jordan Kotler, but I think I won't. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll just tell you that this, is, this has to do with, uh, with computation perspective on experiments, but uh, not just in adding interaction, but over the past few years we've seen many different quantum computing components entering into, the, into what people are trying to do with quantum experiments, and there is a missing theory for that. Like, what does it mean to do experiments in the presence of, quantum, of, of various quantum computing ideas like adding entanglement, adding add correction, etc. And, and, um, and actually, we took up the challenge and we defined a model called QAM, quantum avoidant measurements, and we showed that, uh, that um, in this model one can actually uh, talk about complexity of measurements in, this pre in the presence of a quantum computer. Would a quantum computer help you perform experiments in the lab? And uh, it turns out that, yes, there is exponential advantage to a quantum computer to perform experiments in the lab. It would help us if we had one. Um, and there are many open questions here, but I think I'll leave this at that. Thank you. It's time for some questions. Can you say a few words about one of these translationally invariant one-dimensional Hamiltonians where it's very hard to figure out the ground state? Um, 
it's not just very hard to figure out the glass, it's very hard to figure even the ground yeah. energy. Yes. Um, so, so there is a very, <coughs> many of these go back to Kintaev's uh, technique of, who, which he attributes this to Dirac, um, um, the technique of basically, uh, actually to find them, and find them, but that's uh, 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 The technique basically talks about uh, moving from dynamics to statics. So, um, uh, in order to show such a thing, the only thing that we know as of now is to start from a problem that we know is very hard, and this is a problem that involves this verification process, which is quantum, this quantum and MA, quantum NP version of, that I described, has a quantum circuit that performs a verification, which is a dynamics. And what we know how to do is we know how to take uh, dynamics of quantum and make it into a local Hamiltonian whose ground state is the history state of this evolution. <coughs> and so if you took, if you look at a very complicated dynamical system and translate it to a Hamiltonian whose ground state is the history of this computation, finding the ground energy will be as hard as understanding the dynamics of this evolution with respect to an unknown solution. Right? The dynamics of the verification has as its input some unknown solutions that it needs to verify. So understanding the evolution with respect to an unknown solution would correspond to understanding the ground energy of this fundamental. And so you've encoded a very, very difficult dynamical problem with an unknown input state into a local Hamiltonian whose ground energy basically tells you if such a, uh, a solution exists or not. And so it's the, it's the dimension of each outside over space that gets very big? Yeah, so it's, it gets constantly big, but it's huge. I don't know. I don't think they even could calculate the number. Um, yeah, but in order to sort of make all these, uh, all this conditioning work, uh, so far we only have access to it using engineering um, tasks of, of, you know, going from dynamics to static, going from all these things. But clearly, there is a, a more fundamental way of, of, uh, of addressing this question, uh, which we don't know yet. Are these generically gasless states? Yes. Um, because the hardness of a local Hamiltonian problem is related to the ground state entanglement, I guess that you couldn't change the hardness of one of these problems by unitary transformation of the Hamiltonian, but is there the possibility of a more general transformation of a local Hamiltonian problem that can move it into a different complexity class wall? being more uh, tractable for either quantum computing or classical computing? Well, if the transformation was, were efficient, then by definition, no, because this would be a map, an efficient map from one to another. Um, so in terms of equivalence, there will be sort of equivalence after this polynomial mapping. Um, so, yeah, I don't, you may have you may have uh, an idea in mind that I'm not uh, following, but as uh, as you said it, I don't see how to do this. I'm just curious, what is the undecidable language in that recent breakthrough, and what, uh, what's the implication that that I might be stuck in the undecidable language? Oh, um, wow! I don't know what's the undecidable. I think it's just the holding problem. Sorry. It's the holding problem. so much money and effort to build on computers. If you ask me, I think there's not enough effort to prove the opposite. Um, I put a lot of time to try to prove the opposite, just in order to see what's the, what is the barrier. Um, 
as you probably guess, I don't see. But uh, but I think I don't know. I think I, I think uh, it's worth a try, another try. I mean, obviously, if if we if, it, if the problem was easy, we would have already stumbled upon a way to do this, and that would have solved a lot of problems for physicists, right? So this is still just a statement that it seems like quantum mechanics is hard to simulate. Yes. Yeah. That, that's still, to you, in your opinion, the strongest suggestion. Yeah, I, would, I don't know. If, I think that's just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to equate that as Shor's algorithm. Yeah. Um, but both of them constitute a very strong suggestion that BGP is different than BGP. If there are no more questions, let's thank Dorit for a thoughtful presentation.